This week, Google announced Gemini 1.0, their latest and most powerful AI model to date. There's a lot to examine, from its impressive technical benchmarks to new multimodal applications, and even to controversy over how those aforementioned things might have been misrepresented. To unpack this news, we'll dive into the three following questions in this video. One, how did we get here and why is Gemini releasing now? Two, what is Gemini and how does it compare to the performance of ChatGPT? And lastly, three, what does this ultimately mean for the customer and future of Google? I think that to best understand the release of Gemini, it may be helpful to look at some AI milestones at Google that led here. Google, like many other big tech companies, has long been involved with AI through its teams at DeepMind and Google Research. And for most of this past decade, that hardcore research and deep tech exploration led to advancements in under the hood technology that enabled Google's other products. For example, their research in machine learning as early as 2001 would go on to power products like Google Search, AutoCorrect, and Google Translate. And through the 2010s, they hit huge technical AI milestones with releases of TensorFlow, TPU, Transformer Architecture, and more. I'll admit I have no technical understanding whatsoever of those aforementioned things, but I think that's part of my point. A layperson consumer like myself didn't pay attention and had no need to pay attention to any of these back-end AI innovations. What we cared about was that when we searched for something with Google Search, it gave us the results that we wanted. Perhaps that's why it was such a shock when OpenAI released ChatGPT in November of 2022. How did this low-key research nonprofit beat out Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and just about everyone to market? Why wasn't Google the first one to deliver an AI-first consumer product to the world? Again, it's not that Google wasn't working on AI. Most of their products are powered by machine learning and some degree of artificial intelligence. They've been plugging at this for over two decades. In some part, it could be that their dedicated AI products were targeted at some engineering and commercial audience, and what made it to their consumers was not overtly marketed or positioned as an AI product. Another factor is that as a huge tech company, under the scrutiny of the press and lawmakers around the world, they have very little margin for error when it comes to releasing things like LLMs that are highly error prone. Whatever combination of reasons, OpenAI sees the opportunity by going all in on advancing their model to GPT 3.5, packaging it in agent form and releasing it directly to the masses. So that takes us to 2022-2023. OpenAI broke the barn doors down with Chaz GPT and set off this AI arms race of sorts across the tech industry. Big tech companies couldn't delay any further and now had to play on the offensive. They had to either rush their AI products to market or risk losing their dominance as this platform started to shift. AIs like ChatGPT, Claude, Gorak, and others fundamentally threatened the Web 2.0 dominance that companies like Google have long held. As the investor and entrepreneur Brad Gerstner describes it, Google's golden goose of search advertising came under serious risk of disruption. The entire architecture of the web, what most internet companies extracted value from, whether you were selling a product or whether you were advertising, was static web pages. You would go to a web page, that web page was optimized for the Google crawler. Right? The Google bot would come there, eat up all that information, and it would show you this in a 10 blue links. Then they would put an advertisement on that page. Um, that's not where the world is headed. The world is headed in a place where we're just going to chat our questions. We're going to say, how do you make a French omelet? And you're going to have this chat agent on this device or another device that just gives you the answers. You're not going to have to search through 10 blue links. And so, yes, a lot of the companies that were beneficiaries of the Google ecosystem are now suspect. So is Gemini good enough, and how does it compare to ChatGPT? Let's do a quick feature rundown. Gemini comes in three tiers. Ultra is the largest and most powerful model for highly complex tasks. Pro is the base tier. This is likely what most consumers will access. And lastly, there's Nano, a smaller model that's built for on-device usage. You can think of these three versions as the base AI models that powers all of Google's various products. For example, the new AlphaCo 2 from Google is a code-generating model powered by Gemini Pro. Google devices like the Pixel 8 will be powered by Gemini Nano. Google Bard, which is their chat GPT equivalent, used to run on Lambda and then Palm, but as of this week, now utilizes Gemini Pro. According to Bard's release notes, this now allows Bard to be more capable at understanding, summarizing, reasoning, coding, and planning. The other significant feature of Gemini is its multimodality, meaning input and output of text, voice, video, etc. In one example, the model could identify relationships from different images, Find a connection between these two images. Let's see what Gemini says. A curved and organic composition, the building is more refined, and the second image is more fluid. Yeah, that worked. In another example, it interpreted completed handwritten homework assignments. Not only can Gemini solve these problems, it can read the answers and understand what was right and what was wrong, and explain the concepts that need more clarification. 
And in another example, it took voice input queries and returned voice output as well. Thank you for the instructions. I've started making my omelet. Does it look ready now? It looks like it's almost ready. You can flip it over to cook the other side. The crowning demo, though, was a six-minute video showing the full multimodal capabilities of Gemini. In it, a person is shown talking and streaming video to Gemini live while engaging with some real-world objects. Gemini, by intaking that audio and video, then replies to all the challenges and questions being presented. Tasks range from image identification, to logical reasoning, to fact recall, and it was hugely impressive, but Google immediately came under fire for allegedly staging some elements of it, like cutting out the load times and not actually conducting the experiment live. The coin should be under the right hand. Hmm, I don't know. The coin is in the left hand using a sleight of hand technique to make it appear as if the coin has disappeared. They simply fed still images to Gemini and then edited the narrative together. I don't know if I should be more mad as many people online are, but right now I actually don't think it's that big of a head fake. I mean sure, Gemini's public product can't do what it did in the video right now, but it's a marketing concept video with disclaimers attached. I think we can be sure that Gemini is going to have this sooner or later, it's just a matter of when. My own guess is that they'll have this functionality in the market within 18 months. This controversy though also raises my earlier point about the competitive lead up to Gemini. Google is under intense pressure to outpace OpenAI, and simply achieving feature parity with GPT-4 isn't enough. They have every incentive to paint Gemini in the strongest light possible. And that leads us to the benchmarking. This was a head-to-head -head comparison to ChatGPT, and they called out key improvements like Gemini Ultra's 90% versus GPT-4's 86.4% score on the MMLU benchmark. There's a slew of others that I don't think we need to dissect here, but the point is, for market competition's sake, they necessarily have to and do indeed show improvement on GPT-4. There's also plenty of debate on the merit of the benchmarking process itself, but that can be a topic for another day. As we wrap this video, the last area I'd like to touch on is what this means for the consumer. For all this talk about benchmarks, I don't think it actually matters that much. Sure, it matters for the narrative and for the positioning to power users and commercial customers, but for most people, the extra, say, 2% clocked on a certain benchmark might not be noticeable in practice. Past a certain threshold of performance, the incremental extra percentage points of performance just have diminishing returns. What matters to end users is ease of adoption, ease of use, and price point. Google has a massive distribution advantage and resource advantage. Their ecosystem products like email, maps, Android, search, YouTube, and more not only gives them a gigantic data advantage, but their AI features immediately reach the consumer without needing to spend money or activate new users the way ChatGPT might have to. On top of that, they can subsidize the cost of servicing these features themselves and perhaps offer premium features as a loss leader in a way that is unsustainable for smaller competitors. We also saw with their dynamic UI example that they're advancing the way people engage with AI beyond just text and visuals. If two competing AIs can fetch equally accurate information, the AI that presents it in a more intuitive and engaging manner for the user may win out. So as the world evolves from traditional Web 2.0 search to AI-powered natural input, it's a race not only for technical superiority, but for front-end innovation. In closing, it has never been a question of if Google would release something like Gemini, but when and what they would deliver. We can expect a constant news cycle going into 2024 because now we'll need to see what GPT-5 brings, what Gemini 2.0 brings, and so on and so forth. For now though, it's an interesting first glimpse into the next evolution of Google. A lot is happening and we'll just be in for a lot of change. Thanks for watching.